All right, today we're going to start off with the 139th Psalm. This is for the chief musician. It's a Psalm of David. O oh Lord, you have searched me and know me, known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Glorious Heavenly Father, how wonderful it is to know the words that David has written here today are true, that you know every one of our days and before one came to pass that they were all known to you. And everything that will happen to us is not unknown to you and that means that you are caring for us and taking care of us uh, as your children and we thank you for that we thank you for the gift of Jesus and by receiving him we can have eternal life and be counted as your child and uh, certainly if we are then you are looking after our days and you know us you know how we're fashioned you know everything that afflicts us you know everything that uh, tries us and tests us and yet we know that you're there with us and we thank you for that Please be with us during this service. Please be with each person here and help them to uh, uh, just be blessed in some way or another by hearing something from your word that will build them up and edify them. And may this sermon be an offering to you of uh, right doctrine and uh, right instruction for the people here. I pray that uh, my words will not depart from uh, the truth of what you would have me say. Lord God, you are great. You are so wonderful. You're so perfect in all your ways. And I thank you for every blessing that you've blessed each one of us with. We just want to give you praise and glory and honor for what you've done for us. Above all, for your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, just a few announcements today. Um, uh, we are really close. Last week, I kind of didn't have anything to say. Um, there are two outstanding parts of our uh, permitting process before we can start working on this building. Uh, one of them is something to do with asbestos, and we had the study done, I think it was Thursday, and so that's been submitted to the county, and hopefully that'll go quickly. The other is a fire marshal concern about how the, uh, the building is laid out and uh, how many people go in there and all that, and uh, the engineer had the right information apparently the first time, and the fire marshal misread it. So hopefully he'll say, okay, I agree with that, and that'll be it. We'll start working next week, and uh, I hope that next Sunday we'll have... Uh, uh, good news that we've actually started doing construction, but uh, until then here we are at the beach and uh, if we are not ready to move into that building by the 4th of July, I'll say this now, the 4th of July we will not meet at Turtle Beach. It'll be an absolute zoo here and we'll probably do that at the house um, down the road, but uh, other than that every week should be pretty good and um, today is our 74th Genesis sermon, uh, so we're moving right along through the book of Genesis and uh, it'll be uh, Genesis 31 verses 1 through 13 and it's entitled Return to the Land of Your Fathers. Uh, Jacob is being given instructions this week to uh, head back home. He's not actually going to depart uh, yet. That'll be next week's sermon. But uh, it's kind of a fun and uh, detailed uh, story today. So I hope that'll bless you. And um, let's see here. Um, 
I have a couple prayer requests. The first one is uh, Paul here, as you know, had his heart surgery recently, and we want to con have continued prayers for his uh, uh, getting better, and also something that is uh, needs to be done tomorrow. Very small procedure, but uh, we want to you know keep that in prayer. And then, uh, of course, we have other people here that have uh, some afflictions and some trials going on in their life. And uh, without being specific on those, uh, I just would ask that you would remember each person here in your prayers, each person that attends at the Church on the Beach. And um, I'm going to get out of the order of the Psalms today. I'm going to read the uh, 129th Psalm instead of going to the 140th. And uh, the reason why is because I have a couple people that email me. You know, generally when I get emails about Bible questions or Bible doctrine, they're, they're rather, uh, you know, there's nothing specific. It's just, can you help me with this? Or what do you think about that? But there are a couple people that uh, email me with very deep questions, or questions that, you know, nobody ever asks these type of things. And um, I told them both this week. I sent them an email and I said, I want you to know that your emails really bless me because they challenge me to think through things and help me to get my thoughts straight. And uh, uh, they also will challenge me in my doctrine, which, you know, I, I don't ever want to claim that my doctrine is perfect. I would like to believe that and I, that I wouldn't be teaching something that's wrong. But at the same time, I, uh, uh, you know, like to be challenged on these things. And it helps me to establish my own thoughts about issues, whether I think I'm right or whether I don't think I'm right. So before I read the 129th Psalm, I will tell you, um, let me read you the first verse and I'll talk about two issues that came up concerning this Psalm, one directly and one just kind of indirectly. Um, psalm 129, um, you know, obviously I've picked the wrong Psalm and uh, uh, hang on a minute here. Uh, wow, you know what? I've, I've picked out the wrong Psalm and so uh, uh, I must have read it wrong. Maybe it was the 29th Psalm. Uh, I just wrote it down, you know, and my handwriting is so bad that it uh, uh, could be that uh, I've written down the wrong psalm. Give me one second here. Psalm 29. Yes, it is. 20. is. I'm glad that uh, I, I figured that one out. I'm not the greatest, uh, not the brightest uh, light bulb in the uh, pack, but uh, I will read you the first verse, and I want you to uh, just think about it, and then I'll tell you why I've decided to do this. This is, um, it says, Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. And uh, the question came specifically, how can we give strength to God? And I thought about it, and I came up with my own thoughts on it. And um, uh, a, a verse came to mind immediately, which, believe it or not, just happened to be in today's sermon. And um, I thought, before I go telling him that, I might as well look at what other commentators have to say about this particular verse. Give him strength. And um, uh, all of the commentators agreed differently than I thought. And that doesn't mean that they're right, and I'm going to tell you why in a second. But they all uh, basically said uh, their intent is ascribe to God strength. And some of the uh, translations actually say it that way. But apparently the P Hebrew doesn't really say it that way. That's how they infer that. And so they use the term ascribe to God strength. And um, that wasn't my thought at all, is that my thought went immediately to uh, uh, verse 31 6 which we're going to talk about today Genesis 31 6 where it says that uh, Jacob would serve Laban with all of his might and my thought was that the mighty ones that it's speaking about in the Bible which would be angels or us uh, we also can do the same thing are to use the glory that we have been endowed with and the strength that we have been endowed with for the further glorification of the Lord in other words when we are giving God strength we are giving him our all in all and whatever it is, whether it's uh, uh, you know being in church or whether it's serving in a mi ministry or a mission field or just doing your job and people seeing that you're a hardworking Christian. And we're gonna talk a lot about hard work today. Um, give God your strength. And Jacob, by giving Laban all of his strength was indirectly giving the glory to God. Laban even acknowledged that when he said, I see that the Lord has blessed me through you. So that is how I perceive this particular uh, 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 question that was given me, but another person asked about God's glory, and he asked, why do you uh, rely or, or speak so much about God's glory? He said that's kind of Calvinist in nature, and I'd never really thought about that, that uh, that's what Calvinists do. You know, I just, having read the Bible and without really uh, hanging on to any particular systematic theology, I just see God's glory revealed throughout the Bible. In uh, the book of Isaiah, it says, um, uh, I will not give my glory to another. 
uh, in John 14, it says that uh, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. In other words, Jesus must be God if Jehovah is not giving his glory to another, and yet the glory is revealed in Jesus. Uh, it speaks about the glory of God shining on us for all eternity in the book of Revelation. And uh, so uh, his question was, well, some people fo focus too much on love, and that becomes very liberal theology because when you focus on God's love, then all of a sudden God loves everybody and nobody's going to hell and God would never send somebody to hell. That is rejecting God's righteousness. That is rejecting God's justice. On the other hand, if you focus too much on God's righteousness, then you get away from the God of love. And all of a sudden you've got a church that's full of really mean-spirited people that think that God lo loves them and doesn't love anybody else. And they're out condemning everybody to hell. So there has to be a balance. All of these attributes of God, his love, his grace, his mercy, his truth, his righteousness, his holiness, his justice, these attributes all had to be reconciled through the cross of Jesus Christ. His glory did not. His glory is innate and it's seen in the creation. It's seen when we think about him and who he is. It's not something that we needed to have reconciled to us. It's something that is simply clarified through the cross. And so to focus on God's glory, we can never do it too much. Whereas we can focus too much on one of the other attributes at the expense of the other attributes. Glory will never take away from one of his attributes. It will only enhance it. So that was my answer to him. Whether that's right or not, you can think about yourself, but uh, we'll go ahead and read the 29th Psalm now. And uh, I hope it'll bless you. This is a Psalm of David. Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forests bare. And in his temple, everyone says, glory. The Lord sat enthroned at the flood and the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Beautiful, beautiful words from uh, our uh, great, sweet, Israel's sweet psalmist, King David. Um, I'm not going to do a New Testament reading today. I'm just going to go ahead and get into the, uh, the sermon. And uh, it's not that uh, I don't want to do one. It's just that uh, we've kind of moved into a different direction and the sun is going to come over us soon and it's going to really start getting hot. And uh, that's because some people are set up over there. So um, I'm going to go ahead and skip a New Testament reading and we'll just uh, uh, get into the sermon, which is uh, Genesis 31. We're into a new chapter. It's verses 1 through 13, and this is called Return to the Land of Your Fathers. And uh, before I do that, as I always do, I'd like to give you this day in history, which is uh, 19 May. And uh, a couple interesting things that happened on 19 May. In 1536, a lady named Anne Boleyn, who was the second wife of King Henry VIII, was beheaded after she was convicted of adultery. Now, um, uh, it's kind of interesting, as I was reading up about Anne, is um, this actually led to a schism between um, King Henry and the Roman Catholics. At one time, the Roman Catholic Church dominated all of Europe. It was called the Holy Roman Empire. So there was this mixing of the church and the state. And um, uh, he, they told him he was married to a lady. He wanted to uh, get divorced from her and marry Anne Boleyn. And um, they were going to uh, excommunicate him or whatever they were going to do as Roman Catholics do. And um, he was like, so what, you know? So basically these type of things, these actions by kings led to a breakdown of the Holy Roman Empire into individual states that uh, followed an individual or particular religion. As we know today, the uh, British Empire is Anglican in nature. And uh, we have um, the, uh, the monarch of the British Empire is the defender of the faith. That is uh, his or her title. And uh, as you know, uh, I've said this before, that uh, Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales, is supposed to take over after his mother. Hopefully, she'll just outlast him. But uh, uh, if, in fact, that doesn't happen, he is determined to be called the defender of faith rather than the defender of the faith. 
And that means that if you defend anything, then you really defend nothing. And I could say, um, uh, my faith is that apple tree, uh, apples fall from trees and they land on the ground, except on Tuesday when they go up in the air. And uh, he'd say, well, I will defend that. That is your faith. And I could say, well, my faith is that uh, I am an exceptionally handsome guy. And whether that's true or not, he'd say, I have to defend it. You see how stupid it is to say I'm the defender of faith. Whatever you have faith in is something he's going to defend. And uh, when in fact there's only one true faith, whatever it is, and what we have to do is determine what that faith is. Um, and, uh, but anyway, this goes all the way back to this Lady Anne Boleyn, is how these things started to separate into uh, different uh, uh, religious denominations, etc. Well, Anne got married to him, and eventually he started looking at other girls, as he was uh, prone to do, and uh, she was eventually uh, beheaded after being convicted of adultery and witchcraft and a few other things that he uh, made up about her. They probably were not true, um, but uh, something that's really interesting is uh, I was kind of going through uh, photos looking uh, for uh, her execution and if, see if they had it in depiction, and they do. And uh, we all know what the, uh, the uh, French guillotine looks like. You get down on your knees and they whack off your head. Or if you're uh, in the later years of England, they had a chopping block. And you'd get down there and they'd use this big axe with this big almost moon-shaped head and it would take off your head. Well, that wasn't the case back in the uh, 1500s. What they did is you stood up and a guy took a sword and he just strayed across. And I thought, man, that would be tragic if they missed the first time. I mean, because you're either going to miss high or low, and it won't get the job done, but it would be a very painful way to die. So um, hopefully all went well for Anne Boleyn at her execution, because I can't imagine. Um, but that's the story of her. Uh, then on the same day, 19 May in 1608, related directly to the same thing, Protestants, Protestant states formed evangelical, the Evangelical Union of Lutherans and Calvinists. Uh, now we know that, um, uh, and this was not a very strong union, it didn't do a great deal, but it was something that happened. Here you have this Holy Roman Empire, and they have apostatized. In other words, they have fallen away from the faith. At the Council of Trent in 1546, the uh, Roman Catholic Church signed certain uh, canons. A canon is a tenet of the faith, and they, nine of their 20-some canons uh, are actually anti-biblical. They're not just unbiblical, they are against the Bible. And um, uh, so the Lutherans are, you know, uh, Martin Luther, he uh, did his thesis that he nailed to the wall at, uh, I think, Firm's Castle or whatever, and uh, uh, Wittenberg maybe is where he did it. Anyway, he, the Lutheran faith started based on what he did. And then after uh, Luther came the uh, John Calvin. He wrote this big uh, book on systematic theology, and he added onto it over the many years until it's its giant work. But uh, uh, they kind of formed this, this union between the two of them, kind of in opposition to the uh, Roman Catholics who, as I said, had departed from the faith. Now, I want to make sure that I say this because uh, from time to time people will say, well, you know, you just belittle uh, Mormons or Catholics or whatever. There are saved people within bad churches, and I'm not here to pick on any individual Catholic. If they have called on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and they understand that from a biblical context, they're saved. They just are in a church that they're not getting that proper theology uh, relayed to them. Um, and that's the same thing with any church. We got pe saved people in churches that used to be very strong Baptist churches, for example. And now the church has kind of faded away from that and uh, uh, they're still saved. They didn't lose their salvation, but they should think about where their alliances are. So keep that in mind. Uh, that was 1608. And then in 1796, which is really right after the founding of our nation, the first U.S. game law was approved. And who would think they'd go all the way back here? But it was a game law that called for penalties for hunting or destroying game within Indian territory. So here we're protecting the Indians' rights at the same time that we're taking away their lands. And this went on for years and years. But um, uh, I will say one thing about this. And, you know, I saw a, a post on Facebook, and I wasn't sure if I was going to say this today, but... I think I can tie it in properly. I saw a picture of a, a bunch of old white guys um, from the, we'll say the revolutionary era um, it, at the top of a photo. And then they had a picture of a bunch of uh, blacks in chains, obviously slavery. And then they had a bunch of uh, Indians in another part of this photo. So they had these three things. And the caption basically said, America was built on uh, our industry, implying the uh, white guys. And then it says, oh, really down here with the blacks and the Indians. 
Um, and, you know, that is an unfair shot at how our nation was organized. Our nation was organized based on a group of people. Some people are hard workers. Some people came here as slaves. There's no doubt about that. Um, industry and innovation, though, comes from work. And we're going to see that today. And these people, you know, whether you like it or not, were the ones that were, I'm talking about the, the people at the top of the photo, were the ones that came with up with the ideas and they came up with the industry as how to take metals out of the ground and how to do these things that had never been done before. The slaves in America, and this is just so you know, they were predominantly in the South and as a matter of fact, uh, even in the North, for the most part, slavery was not something that was ever a part of the infrastructure of the Northern states. The South and their economy accounted for a very, very, very small portion of the American industry. And that was a big part of the Civil War, why the North was so, uh, so powerful at the beginning. And, and they had all of this industry, they had all of this uh, uh, you know, technology. And the slaves did things that other people either couldn't do or couldn't do um, uh, efficiently. And it would be comparable to the Mexicans working today. We cannot say that America is being built by Mexicans today but they are doing uh, all types of work at very low wages. Now, I'm not saying that's fair or unfair. I'm simply making a, uh, a something for you to think about, is that America is not being built by Mexicans. A portion of our society is being funded by their work. Now, what we should do is work to raise their standards and get them up to a decent pay of living um, if they're legal. But um, uh, in other words, photos like that only diminish and they only harm what should be a history of industry and hard work in America. That's the only point I'm trying to make. And the reason why I'm making that is because we are going to talk about that today. And we're going to see exactly that in there. So I'm, I'm in no way saying that slavery was right. It was a wrong thing for human beings to do and which we continue to do in the world today. I, I hope the point is well made though. Um, and speaking of that, on this same day in 1856, a guy named Charles Sumner spoke out against slavery. This is prior to the Civil War. The promises of the Founding Fathers were to get rid of slavery as quickly as possible after the establishment of the nation. They did not want to address that at the beginning, though, or the nation never would have come together as a nation. And so they said, we're going to defer this to a later time. Well, the time went by, the time went by, and eventually people started to speak out against it. And this guy, Charles Sumner, was very, very anti-slavery. He spoke out against it. He changed parties several times because he didn't feel that uh, his agenda was being uh, uh, properly uh, treated. And, uh, but he was not a very well-spoken person. He would attack people right on the Senate floor. And uh, one time he did so, and two days later, a guy came in, another senator, into the Senate and beat him so badly with his cane that he almost died. I mean, he just kept beating him even after he was on the ground completely pulverized. And for the rest of his life, he suffered with um, uh, pains in his head. He, he, with, uh, he couldn't sleep, he had nightmares. So um, this, is, uh, uh, this man it gave basically his life and his efforts for the cause of getting rid of slavery. So hats off to this guy. Uh, 1857, this is something that we see even to this day and it's changed very little. The first fire alarm system was patented by Channing and Farmer. Now, of course, we have microchips and all that in these things nowadays, but the, the, the structure and the, the concept of these fire systems looks just the same as it did all those years ago. And uh, what a marvel for moving society forward because, you know, places, we saw what happened in Brazil a, a couple months ago. All those hundreds of people died because of poor fire equipment. And uh, uh, that's one of the griefs that we're getting in this little place that we're going to open this church in is the fire marshal. Well, I'd rather have more grief with that than less. We want to make sure that we are safe. And uh, if that's what it takes is a little delay, then that's fine. Um, here we go, 1864, the Union and Confederate armies launched their last attacks against each other in Spotsylvania, Virginia. And I actually passed through there when I uh, was traveling around America a couple years ago, somebody told me about it. And so uh, I, I passed the sign. So what I did is I went back on the highway and I drove back around so I could get a photo of the sign entering Spotsylvania. And uh, this is where that happened. And if you go there, you can see cannons laid out and you can see uh, the open fields and all this, what's going on. But something else that's very interesting about this place, Spotsylvania, is where vampire dogs all go to retire. Spotsylvania. Okay, never mind. Anyway, uh, 1911, the uh, first American criminal conviction 
that was based on fingerprint evidence occurred in New York City. And uh, that is, you know, you got to know that that's just an amazing achievement is that uh, we could now identify people individually because of these things. And it's a real science. I did a little uh, looking on it and it, it really does take a lot of uh, um, effort to uh, analyze these things and to make sure you're getting it right because some can be very close. But, uh, you know, if you have like a mark on your hand, I've tore off this side of this finger and so I have no uh, uh, what do you call it, a fingerprint at all, well, that will be part of my fingerprint because it'll meld into there and it would be obvious if my fingerprint was on there. But um, it's a real science, it's an interesting science, and of course then came DNA, which is even more accurate, and we can get DNA evidence from a long time ago and we can use that. And uh, then something that came out a few years ago, if you're aware of it, is the, it's called the monk technique, which is even more accurate than um, uh, DNA. It's where you use your hands in a certain way and you identify. Has anybody seen Monk? Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, if you haven't seen Monk, then you have no idea. But there's this guy on TV. He's an investigator and he's a little bit crazy. But when, when he looks at things, he's always going like this and he's analyzing with his hand. So anyway, obviously that went over some of your heads. But uh, Monk is a really fun program. So uh, it, it's not accurate. It's just to show people. Um, Anyway, let's see here, in 1926, Thomas Edison spoke on the radio for the very first time. And uh, here's this great guy, I talk about him whenever they mention him because um, uh, he was a hardworking guy, just like we're gonna see with Jacob today. And his uh, idea about innovation was this, 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. In other words, he'd get an idea and it would take him 99% of the time would be working on that idea. And a lot of times it never panned out. But he was a guy that slept about three hours a day. He'd take little short five minute cat naps throughout the day and he'd work all the way through the night continuously. Uh, he was a ruthless person though, as far as his competition. He'd either buy people out or he'd uh, malign them so that they uh, uh, would fall out of favor with whoever he was competing against. But he was a, a very great inventor. And he, he, I think still to this day, holds more patents than any other human alive. And uh, if you ever have never been there, you can go right down to Fort Myers and see the Edison Museum. And I would recommend that to anybody. It is really neat to go there. It's a beautiful area. He did a lot of botany and the plants that he planted almost, uh, what, uh, you know, 80, 90, 100 years ago are still out there growing and they're just beautiful. And um, uh, he's right next door to Henry Ford. They were very good friends and they built identical houses next door to each other. And there were no roads at the time, so they had to come in by the, the bays and uh, they shipped all that in and built these houses. So please go if you've never been to the Edison Museum. Uh, 1926, Mussolini announced democracy was deceased and Rome turned fascist. And of course that was a step towards World War II along with Hitler and uh, uh, Japan, the Axis powers. And uh, just in case you do not know what fascism is, it has nothing to do with right-wing or left-wing ideology in America. And it's not right to say, well, the left is really more fascist than the right, or the right is more fascist than the left. It is a concept which uh, does not apply in America because it's uniting behind a single ruler in a um, militaristic way. And we don't have that in America even on a good day. Uh, they believe that they're supreme to everybody around them. Uh, of course, in America, we have two parties and they never agree on anything. And uh, you, you cannot say that the right will ever be a fascist state if they take over. It simply won't happen. And uh, uh, so fascism is what it is, um, but it's not anything that we can say. It, it's become more a pejorative in America. It's, it's a maligning word rather than anything else, but we need to make sure that we don't use it in the wrong context. Uh, kind of on the same lines, in 1967, planes bombed Hanoi for the first time. And uh, that's kind of a tragedy because the war had been going on, I think since the early 60s, 63 is when we actually started ramping up. And um, I was watching a thing with my wife here on uh, World War II a couple days ago. And after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, of course we know Delano's speech, which everybody's heard a million times, but right after he spoke, the uh, House and Senate uh, voted Everybody except one person in the House and Senate voted to uh, enter the conflict. And when they did, their words were, all, all of our resources and our effort will be uh, dedicated to resolving this matter in our favor. And that right there shows the difference between what happened in World War II and the wars that have followed. Uh, George Bush Sr. was very good about doing the same thing. He engaged this country to win. 
And, uh, uh, but that did not happen with Korea, and it did not happen especially with Vietnam, where the politicians decided where the uh, decisions would be made as far as bombing and fighting. And that has cost us. It's cost us in our people. It's cost us in our uh, status as a nation. And I'm not promoting war. I'm not trying to say that it's right or wrong. What I am saying, though, is that if you make a commitment, it's either all or nothing. And to not do that is to disservice the very people that are now expected to put their lives on the line. And so uh, if you disagree with that, I, I cannot help you. It, it is all or it is nothing. And we did the right thing in World War II, and we've done the wrong thing many times since then. And uh, I, better to stay out of war than to not commit to uh, uh, winning that war. Um, we have in uh, 1992, very sad, the next two, uh, Vice President Dan Quayle criticized um, the CBS sitcom Murphy Brown for having its title character to decide to bear a child out of wedlock. And he was so maligned for that. And uh, the poor guy, Dan Quayle, was an upright, honest, decent person. And he, you know, he spelled potato wrong, and people are still maligning him about that today. And we've got a vice president now that can't say anything right. Nothing that comes out of his mouth makes any sense at all. It is, it is completely contrary to right reason, and nobody says a thing. And we're still worrying about Dan Quayle spelling a potato. So uh, he was right. We need to have moral standards, especially on public viewing TVs. And I'm not talking that CBS and NBC and ABC are public, but they're open to the public. And there should be standards on there. If you want to watch a bunch of filth, you can turn on home, de uh, home box office or any of these other things and pay for it. But uh, what has happened because of this is that it's gone down that almost nothing is watchable for the Christian on TV anymore. It's a very sad situation we've got in because of this. And here's one more on the same lines. On this day, 19 May in 1999, Rosie O'Donnell. I'm sure all of you love her to death. She and Tom Selleck uh, got into an uncomfortable verbal issue concerning the gun control debate on her show. And uh, she invited him on to talk to him about his book. And she spent the entire time maligning him. She hit him. She berated him because of his beliefs in our Second Amendment. If you don't want to support the Second Amendment and own a gun, don't. But it is our right as a citizen to have a gun. And she was brutal to this guy. And she's a disgusting human being anyway. I mean, it just, there's no doubt about it. But what she did was uncalled for in the extreme. So uh, that was this day, 19 May in history. And uh, we'll go ahead and read our text and uh, we'll move on from there. This is Genesis 31 verses 1 through 13. It says here, Now Jacob heard the words of Laban's son saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's, and from what was our father's, he has acquired all of this wealth. And Jacob saw the countenance of Laban, indeed it was not favorable toward him as before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field to his flock, and said to them, I see your father's countenance, and it is not favorable toward me as before. But the God of my father has been with me, and you know that with all my might I have served your father. Yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times, but God did not allow him to hurt me. If he said thus, the speckled shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore speckled. And if he said thus, the streaked shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore streaked. So God has taken away all the livestock of your father and given them to me. And it happened at the time when the flocks conceived that I lifted my eyes and saw in a dream. And behold, the rams which leaped upon the flocks were streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. Then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift your eyes now and see all the rams which leaped on the flocks are streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land, and return to the land of your family. Jacob left Canaan 20 years uh, after 20 years in Mesopotamia. And before he left, the Lord promised to be with him and to keep him wherever he went. Some sermons ago, we saw that his time out of the land of promise pictures Israel's time out of their, uh, during their exile out of the land of promise as well. God, who cannot lie, promised that he would return them to their land. And in fact, in Leviticus chapter 26, if you read that chapter, it's hinted there that there would be not just one, but there would actually be more than one exile. And you can infer two from that. Isaiah picked up on that. And in the 11th chapter of Isaiah, he promised 
that they would be returned a second time even before they had been exiled one time. Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah gives us very detailed information concerning the duration of the first exile of the people of Israel. It's 70 years. Daniel, he was one of the exiles, was carried up to Babylon and eventually Babylon fell and he was working as one of the uh, chief bigwigs in the uh, uh, Medo-Persian Empire and he was reading the scriptures of Jeremiah. Now, you got to think about this. Jeremiah was written only about 70 years earlier and uh, it's already considered God's word. The prophet of God knew that this was God's word and he's reading this and it says in the book of Jeremiah, 70 years are declared for the desolations of Jerusalem and um, he started his great prayer to God. It's time to return us. Your word says that you will return us and in fact, it's time to do so. The surety of God's word is realized in the kept promises that are found there. Another example of this is Ezekiel chapter four, which gives us very, very detailed information concerning the return of the Israelites the second time. And we can tell to the day when they will be returned based on that. So we need to be sure that we understand that God's word is correct, it is true, and it tells us these things for a reason. Because of these promises, which all the world have seen, and I don't mean that in the individual case where every person in the world's picked up a Bible and read it and said, oh yeah, I should be supporting Israel. But the idea of Israel should be seen by the whole world and it should be transmitted down to the people of the world because of that. All the world has seen these things fulfilled time and time again. We can be more sure in the promises which are future to us right now. This. This right here is the reason why prophecy is such an important tool in the Bible and why it is such an important tool in human history. It affirms the belief of the believer and it is a witness against the unbeliever. The world today, even among Christians, is filled with disbelief that is made to the promises right to Israel. For the saved Christian, and I am absolutely certain on this, although the Bible doesn't say it, I just, I, I'm certain of it. For the saved Christian, their rewards and their loss of rewards will be partially based on their treatment of this group of people. For the unsaved, the very condemnation they deserve will be highlighted by their rejection of his hand upon Israel. Our text verse for today comes from Jeremiah chapter 33. And I will cause the captives of Judah and the captives of Israel to return. And I will rebuild those places as at the first. I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me, and I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned and by which they have transgressed against me. Let us endeavor to accept God's word and accept that regardless of whether they deserve it or not, Israel is back in the land by God's direction, and they will remain planted there because of his promises to them. And so may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. I have three thoughts for you today. The first is jealous of prosperity. This is verse one of chapter 31. Now Jacob heard the words of Laban's son saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's and from what was our father's, he has acquired all of this wealth. This is now approximately the year 2265 Anno Mundi or from the creation of the world. Interestingly, this chapter here begins with jealousy outside of Jacob's immediate family towards him. The last chapter, chapter 30, began with jealousy within the family and directed toward Leah. Let me read that to you. Now, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. This is no mistake and it's showing us the contrast between these two chapters. Jealousy is actually used both times to bring about God's purposes. The first time it's to build up Israel's family and the second time it is to precipitate his leaving for the land of Canaan, the promised land. Laban's sons accuse Jacob here of taking away all of the family's wealth, but this is untrue. Laban actually still had sheep. It's just that what Jacob has now is so much more than what Laban has. They are green with envy and accusing him of stealing everything that they had. We know that Laban has flocks because the original flock that was divided six years earlier is in the possession of uh, his sons. And at that time, his sons took all of the abnormal colored ones and Jacob took all of the normal colored ones. Laban had plenty of sheep from both flocks and we're gonna see this reflected in verse 19 of this chapter. If Jacob had prospered, 
and he has, it in no way diminishes what they should have had also earning it through the same period. In other words, he's given a certain amount of sheep and they're given a certain amount of sheep and they should have both prospered equally. But they weren't attentive to their flocks and they weren't diligent in their work like Jacob was. If they were, they would have increased their wealth as well. Jacob did work hard and he was blessed because of it, which of course, of course brought about their envy. Jealousy is a green-eyed monster and they are jealous. The Geneva Bible says this about this verse, the covetous think that whatever they cannot take is taken from them. The term Laban's sons used for wealth here, they say he's taken all of our wealth is the term kavod and it means to become heavier, to have a heaviness. Jacob has become heavy with the wealth that uh, he now possesses. But along with wealth comes something else that the Bible warns about, cares and anxieties. And this is something that's described in Ecclesiastes chapter five. Let me read this to you. He, think of yourself and think of where your priorities are in this life as I'm reading this, all right? He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This is also vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. So what profit have the owners except to see them with their own eyes? The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. This is proven true around the world, I assure you of this. When people are poor but have enough to sustain them, they're generally content with their life. But as wealth increases, we worry about our things. We put locks on our doors and we put alarms on our cars. We worry about the dust that's on our shelves and whether the pillows on our couch are aligned properly. And if our, our neighbor buys a TV, we have to go out and buy a bigger one. We worry over the things that we have to the point that we lose sleep thinking about those things. Solomon wrote those words about 3,000 years ago and they ring all the more truly today. He wrote them at a time when there was very little amassed, amassed wealth in the world and yet he understood this premise. As wealth increases for the masses, worry over our stuff has led to a world full of neur neurotic people who rely on pills to take away their worries. Verse two, and Jacob saw the countenance of Laban. Indeed, it was not favorable toward him as before. Not only are Laban's sons jealous of him, but Laban is too. Six years earlier, it was he who accepted the terms of the agreement at which Jacob proposed. And he didn't only accept it, he jumped at it. He was completely overjoyed at the prospect of what Jacob proposed. They were the delight of his heart. He just couldn't get enough of what he was hearing. They were an offer too good to be true, but now things have turned against him and he's sullen. As the Bible says, his attitude towards Jacob wasn't as before. Jacob was industrious, he was crafty, and he was blessed by God in his work and it paid off for him. But it has resulted in trouble between him and his father-in-law Laban. Ecclesiastes chapter four gives us another good comparison. It says, again, I saw for all the toil and every skillful work a man is envied by his neighbor. This also is vanity and grasping for wind. Envy is such a powerful force that it often even leads to murder, and we know that. The most famous case of envy leading to murder in human history occurred in a place called Jerusalem against a descendant of Jacob. We read about it in Matthew chapter 27. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. It was so obvious to Pilate what was going on that he offered the people an alternative to the decision of the leaders. Their envy had caused them to condemn an innocent man. Who would have ever imagined that the condemnation that they forced on Jesus was the only thing that could ever lead to their salvation. The amazing work of God is never more evident than in the life of his son, including the envy that those he walked among held against him. Our third verse today. Then the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your family and I will be with you. This is the first time that the term Lord or Jehovah has been mentioned since two sermons ago. 
During the last sermon, which pictured the growth of the church, the Lord wasn't mentioned at all. Now he returns to the narrative to speak to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. The Lord knows exactly the right time for all things, including the movement of his covenant people for his covenant pur purposes. And I will tell you this, we've been waiting to move into this building now. It's been 10 weeks since the building was purchased and nothing has been done except the few things that I could do apart from uh, permitting by the county. And somebody was talking to me about that this past week and I said, you know, I'm not at all concerned about it because this is the Lord's building. And this is where the Lord wants us, obviously right now is out on the beach. Because if he wanted us in there, everything would have gone exactly as it should have from the beginning. Nothing happens apart from the Lord's will, nothing. And so he will move us into this building or not according to when it is right for him. And we just have to trust that that's true and not get upset about these things. This passage that we're looking at is certainly a picture of the return of Israel to their homeland. We can back up now to verse chapter one, or verse one of this chapter and see that the jealousy of Laban's sons is actually a picture of the jealousy of the world at the prosperity of the Jewish people as they've moved around the world. The same exact terminology that they use, these two sons, is used time and time and time again by the people of the world. We hear it all the time and we hear it even now. I've even heard it in my own family. The Jews have taken away all that is ours and from it, they have acquired all this wealth. Have you ever heard that kind of sentiment? I've heard it a million times in my life. The world goes from the attitude of Laban's sons to the next attitude, that of Laban. Their countenance changes towards the Jewish people because of the jealousy and they no longer turn their faces toward them. And what's the result? Seizing what they've earned, growing hostility towards them and eventually either exiling them or killing them. It is the theme, the entire theme of the book of Esther is this premise right here. That was during their first dispersion. And it has been seen again and again. If you read your history about the Jewish people, wherever they went, this happened. And it culminated in the German Holocaust and the Russian pogroms, which eventually got them to move back to their land by God's direction. As the proverb says, wrath is a cruel and anger a torrent, but who is able to stand before jealousy. Despite the conflict and despite the situation, the Lord's words to Jacob are reflected twice to the people of Israel after both the Babylonian and the Roman exile. Return to the land of your fathers and your family, and I will be with you. Now, before we move on, and I want to be fair about this, I want to ask you this. Do they, the Jewish people, do they deserve having been returned to the land of Israel? Do they deserve it? Do they merit what God has given them? And the answer is no. I'll tell you what, I was watching an episode of House. If you've never seen it, it's a, uh, uh, one of these dramas, a medical drama on TV, and I was flipping through the channel and it came on, and uh, there was a guy that was being brought in. He's a Jewish guy, and he is in the porn business, and his wife is a porn star. And they, they just took it as just part of their daily life. And one of the doctors on this show is a Jewish doctor, and he's having an adulterous affair with a, uh, another woman. And this isn't uncommon at all, nor is it uncommon that many Jews are entirely secular. They don't have anything to do with God at all. Or, believe it or not, they will follow one of countless religions. They'll follow Hinduism, they'll follow Buddhism, they'll even convert to Islam. No problem with it within Judaism. I know Jews that have carved idols all over inside their house, and they believe that these things are going to give them blessing or that they're going to be spiritually blessed by having a little Buddha in their house. I could go on, but the question again is, is this deserving of God's favor? And the answer is no. So why has God reestablished Israel once again as a nation? The answer is found in Ezekiel chapter 36, and I'm going to read it to you. It says here, therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. Think of the profanity of being a porn star or a, an opium dealer or, you know, all of the things that they do get into. They're just as crooked as the rest of the world. He goes on. He says, and I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. The reason that this has happened is because the people of Israel bear his 
name. They are his people and he is going to be glorified through them, whether they like it or not and whether they acknowledge it or not. In fact, he says that they have profaned him among the nations and this is something that they continue to do to this day. But God is faithful to his unfaithful people. The time has come and the description of the land that is found two chapters later in Ezekiel 38 could only be speaking of modern times. The prophecies have never been fulfilled in the past and anyone who cannot see this is either deluded or they're an anti-Semite or possibly both. Just as Jacob was returned, Israel has been returned and time marches on. Here's what it says in Ezekiel 38. After many days, you will be visited. In latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations and now all of them dwell in safety. Our second thought today, unfair treatment. Verse four, so Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field, to his flock. Make a mental note here, just so that you are aware of this, that Rachel is placed first in this verse. Even though she's the second wife, she is the beloved of Jacob and also the one that pictures grace rather than the law, which Leah pictures. Now, rather, going back to the, rather than going back to the camp, he called the two of his wives to the field. His flight is going to be in secret, and so secrecy needs to be maintained. Plus, by staying away from the camp, he's going to be able to avoid meeting any of Laban's family, which by this time could have actually turned bad. The Lord has directed him to move, and he's going to do so very carefully. Verse 5, And said to them, I see your father's countenance, that it is not favorable towards me as before, but the God of my father has been with me. Here in the fields and among his flocks, he knows that their father isn't looking favorable toward him anymore. He's worried about what will occur between them and what has already come about between them, which we're going to read about in just a minute. Despite what's happened, though, he says that the God of his father has been with him. The same God who led Abraham and Isaac is not bound by national boundaries. In other words, it's not the God of the land of Canaan. He is the God of creation, and he is now outside of the land of Canaan, proving that he's sovereign even over that territory as well. This same God who led Abraham and Isaac is transcendent over all of the nations. Jacob might not be in the land of promise, but he is still under the covenant care. And this is no less true with Israel during both of their exiles. They may have been outside of the covenant graces, but they were never outside of the covenant care. Exile to them occurs because of disobedience. But even in exile, God has tended to them and he has cared for them. Verse six, and you know that with all my might, I have served your father. Jacob didn't just serve Laban for the past six years, but for 24 years now. The first seven years were for Rachel, and that should have been the end of the matter, but then Laban deceived him, and he got another seven more years of work out of him because of his deception. Now think of it this way. If he was a crummy worker, Laban would have just simply given him Rachel, and that would have been the end of it. But he worked so well that Laban deceived him in order to get seven more years of work out of him. And if he had started to slack off during those second seven years, he never would have hired him for the agreement that they made. But he did. When he did, he said that the Lord had blessed him because of Jacob's work. The last six years is no different, except that the blessings went to Jacob and not to Laban. And once again, we see the same pattern in the Jewish people among the nations. They move in and bring prosperity to all of the people around them. Eventually, the area benefits from their work too, and their efforts promote the society's welfare. And there's nothing at all wrong with this. But eventually they, like any hardworking citizen in America, in today's America, will get penalized for their labors. What is earned through industry is envied, and it's taken away by the lazy and by the wicked. Verse seven, yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages 10 times, but God did not allow him to hurt me. Time and time again in the Bible, the term 10 times or the number 10 is used as an idiom meaning numerous. It indicates a fullness of times. In the case of Laban, whenever Jacob's flock began to grow, Laban would just simply change his wages. The verse here shows the gracious, gracious nature of Jacob because he could have stood and demanded on the original agreement. However, he allowed Laban to just roll right over him 
And this is the same thing that happens time and time again to the Jewish people as well as to conservative, hardworking Christians. In America, our wages are changed any time the government needs more money. They simply break whatever promise they made and they raise their, our taxes or they just pass another fee. The ones who suffer the most are not the poor. The poor are already poor. It's those who are the hardest working that are the most, uh, the ones that are most likely to suffer. They're the ones that are diligently putting forth their effort and the government takes their efforts away from them. Again, we can turn right to Ecclesiastes 5 to see the truth of this. It says there, if you see the oppression of the poor and the violent perversion of justice and righteousness in a province, now think of America today, the violent perversion of justice and righteousness, we've got five major scandals going on in our administration right now. And within two weeks of each other, five major scandals have come out. The perversion of justice and righteousness. And he says, for high official watches over high official and higher officials are over them. And the higher you get, the more corruption there is. With every new level of authority that is over an individual, another level of oppression and a perversion of justice comes about. Jacob had only one level above him, and yet he felt the injustice of it. Laban's attitude towards Jacob is a picture of what has happened throughout history. The mistreating of God's hardworking people out of jealousy and an inability to demonstrate self-industry. However, when a person knows where their blessings come from, they know that whatever another person does to them is temporary. Jacob, the deceiver of his father, has now been deceived by his own father-in-law, and yet God protected him in the process. His faithfulness has testified to his state before the Lord, and he's prospered. Verse eight, if he said thus, the speckled shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore speckled. And if he said thus, the streaked shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore streaked. This here shows the direct providence of God over the flocks of Jacob. We have to go back to a previous chapter, I think it was right in chapter 30, to see what the original terms were. There it said, everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it is with me. The original agreement was that all, all of the abnormally colored flocks would be Jacob's. However, it quickly became apparent that the majority of the new births were abnormally colored. And so Jacob changed it to only a portion of them, such as the speckled. The next season, only speckled would be born. And so J Laban would say to Jacob, okay, now the speckled will be mine and all the spotted will be yours. And the next season, what would happen? Only spotted would come out. This then shows that there is more than just genetic engineering on Jacob's part. God's hand is directly on him. What is happening here goes back to a previous thought in a previous sermon in which I wanna explain now. The flocks of Jacob are a picture of the people of the church selected by God and who are marked in a unique way to identify them. I said then that the external markings cannot be equated with circumcision in the flesh. And the reason why is because Laban continuously kept changing the terms. And so the external markings must be pointing to a different type of marking, an internal marking, the sealing of the Holy Spirit. This is an internal identifier, not mere external circumcision. That's an outward sign. This is important to understand because the flocks Jacob obtained are pointing to the true people of God. Whether they're Jew or Gentile makes no difference. They are selected by God and they are his people. And we're gonna see this more clearly in a few verses. No matter though, the colors always came out to Jacob's advantage and thus it had to be by God's providence. Laban was too blinded to see this. And we as humans are also too blinded to see God's blessings upon his people, be it Christians or Jews, the world envies without thinking. One point to be made here is that Jacob never tells his wives about his own methods for getting the flock's uh, colors to be changed. If you remember peeling those rods, he never says anything about that to his wives. But this doesn't mean that he was hiding anything. What is true, and I'll tell you what, all of you can go and look right in the mirror to see this. Divine help in no way excludes self-help. In fact, I gotta tell you something, they complement each other. When we sit around waiting for God's miracles to happen, we very well may be wasting the very miracles that God is waiting to give. The blind man on the roadside who wanted Jesus to come and heal him didn't just sit there and hope that the, Jesus is gonna walk up to him and heal him. 
Instead, he acted. Here's what it says from uh, Mark 10. Now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho, Jesus, uh, with his disciples in a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. He's looking for a miracle and he's not just sitting there waiting for it to happen. He cries out and uh, it says, um, but the uh, crowds, then many warned him to be quiet. But he cried all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. If you want it, he may provide it through you, to you, and not to you alone. Don't sit idly by and expect God to do all the work. That's a fundamental error that way too many Christians make. They go to church and they claim promises. I claim financial breakthrough. It ain't gonna happen unless you get out there and get to work. God's not just going to open up the sky and start dropping money on your head. It's not going to happen. And Jacob proves this by being industrious and working hard and using his God-given talents for the benefit of the flock. Verse 9, so God has taken away all the livestock of your father and given them to me. Now, whether it was by his personal efforts, which were blessed by God, or whether it was by God's blessing apart from his efforts, Jacob has let us know that the transfer of the wealth is ultimately of the Lord. Laban has only himself to blame, and Jacob has only God to credit. Jacob is telling his wives this so that they understand the situation he's facing and what the result of it ultimately must be. Our third thought today, the God of Bethel. Verse 10, and it happened at the time when the flocks conceived that I lifted my eyes and saw in a dream and behold, the rams which leaped upon the flocks were streaked, speckled and gray spotted. This verse and the next two are extremely complicated to understand. And there are clues that are in the Hebrew which only confuse scholars more. It appears that these are two separate visions. One is in verse 10 that I just read, the other is in verse 11 and 12. The first is thought to be at the beginning of the six years of labor, although some think that it came right at the end of the six years of labor. If it was at the beginning, then it was to teach him in advance that no matter what course of action he took, God would bring about the prosperity. If it's at the end of the six years, it was to show what God had done during his six years of labor. Either way, the result comes out the same, but it would have made a big difference to Jacob and it makes a big difference to us to know the outcome as well. In other words, and we can look at this as a lesson directly related to the Bible itself. God has given us his words in the pages of the Bible, just like Jacob had his vision. We're gonna compare the two for a second. We can look at the word and we can know the final outcome of what will happen and be assured of it with absolute confidence. Or we can look at the word and see what God has done He's already done these things for us, and we can see how he has accomplished everything so far, and also what he will do for us in our future lives, what is coming. So the thought we can make here concerning the Lord's word to Jacob, I'm gonna take a New Testament verse and I'm gonna explain it from either direction. This is Jesus, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Or I have built my church and the gates of hell could not prevail against it. Either way, the outcome is the same at the end of the day. How we perceive the words of the Bible is the most important decision that we can ever make. If it is truth, then what it tells us has been is true. And what it tells us will be, therefore, must be true. We are somewhere along the path of the words it proclaims and we're moving towards its fulfillment. One thing to tell you here is that all of a sudden, a new word is used to describe the colors of the flock in this verse. It's translated here as gray spotted. This is the Hebrew word berudim, and it has never been used ever in the Bible to this verse right here. The color has never been mentioned before. It comes from the word barod. The spots are white like hailstones. The other goats were white with black, but these are black with white. They are completely new. And the introduction is probably, this is just me thinking, why would God do this? It's probably to show us that no matter what Laban asked for, 
God would introduce something new to show the truth of his blessing to Jacob. In other words, God is in complete control. And here we go with our own life application. God is always going to introduce something new. When you get hemmed in by your enemies, he's gonna have another exit that they never thought of. And that's what's going on right here. And that's why this word that has never been used is suddenly given to us. Laban changes the wages, God makes a new type of wages that never even existed. And he will do that for you. I absolutely assure you, if you put your trust and your confidence in how he is leading your life, your life will be led in this manner. He will always have a new door. That doesn't mean you're not gonna suffer. That doesn't mean that you're not gonna die someday. All of these things are going to happen in our life. But as we are going through life's trials, a new door is being opened, a new avenue of God expressing that he is in control of your situation, whatever it is. I had a friend that had, uh, I mentioned her a week ago, she had surgery on her spine this past week because she uh, uh, had cancer in her spine. And she has now a new door, a new avenue, because she has the experience of the old things that have happened to her. And God is going to open a new direction. Now she's not gonna be able possibly to move in a certain way, but that's going to lead her. God is working these things out in a way that we can understand that he is in control of it. And that's symbolized by this one word, barod, or berudim, this, this new color of these flocks. Verse 11, then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream saying, Jacob, and I said, here I am. This is either Jacob's second dream now or the internal response to the first. Jacob has a vision where he sees what happened with the flocks. After this, be it six seconds or six years, the angel of God speaks to him and he answers. The angel of the of God here is the Lord who spoke to him at Bethel. Therefore, it is Jesus. All are one in this picture and he will identify himself this way in just a moment. He now confirms the dream that Jacob relayed to his wives just a verse ago, verse 12. And he said, lift your eyes now and see all the rams which leap on the flocks are streaked, speckled and gray spotted. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. And sure enough, just as Jacob's dream showed the mating of the ram's colors, the Lord has confirmed his dream. The Lord knew that Laban had cheated him and would continue to cheat him. And so he directed the flocks according to his wisdom as the creator. Everything that's happened here has been at the Lord's direction. It is meant as an encouragement to him so that he will commit himself to what he will be next directed to do. Something that's probably a little bit scary. Return home where your brother is and who once intended on killing you. God has been watching and God will continue to watch over him. Once again, perfect life application. We don't know the next thing that's coming, but God is giving us all of these trials, like my friend that had that surgery, so that she is prepared for the next trial in life. Some of you have had cancer, some of you have had this or that or financial troubles, whatever. That is only there to mold you for what is coming in the future. Maybe something better, maybe something worse, but you will be able to use your past experiences for what God is going to do for you in the future. And that is exactly why he went through this. And the Lord is reminding him of that. And then he says, now it's time to go back to your, your promised land. And someday we're gonna go to the promised land with all of these experiences behind us. That time is coming. Verse 13, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family. The reassuring words here echo back 20 years. Jacob was 77 years old when he left Canaan and as he did, he traveled through Bethel and he had a vision. And the Lord spoke these words to him in this vision. It said, behold, I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. And true to his promise, he has been with him and he has kept him and is now directing him back to the land of his birth. The Lord reminds him though of the pillar and the vow that he made at that time. In essence, he's saying, I am fulfilling my words to you. Now you must fulfill your words to me. And remember, Jacob promised a tenth of everything to the Lord. But as I said at that time, it doesn't say what Jacob would do at the 10th, but he did promise a 10th to the Lord. And he's reminding him of this right here. Jacob's time of exile is ending and Israel's time of exile has ended. God who is ever faithful attends to his people, his family and his flock. Now this is the end of today's verses and it asks us to think on the things that we may have vowed when we were in dire straits. We ask the Lord for help and make promises in the process. 
when he helps, we need to remember our promises. Did we promise to give up, you know, an extramarital affair or drugs or gambling or booze? Then keep that vow. Did we promise to the Lord that we're going to go to church every day, every Sunday for the rest of our lives? As painful as that may be, keep the vow. The Bible asks us to pay our vows, whatever they are. And we're reminded of that in this verse right here. Maybe you've never encountered the saving grace of the Lord before. Now that's something you can do without a vow. He simply wants you and he wants to be your Lord. So let me take a moment and let me tell you how that can happen before we leave today. Jesus Christ came in the flesh, a human being, God united with human flesh. So he's fully God and he's fully man. And he lived that perfect life that not one of us here could ever live. He gave that life up in exchange for all of the wrong things that every human being that has ever existed has done. All of that wrongdoing, God is really angry at, all of it. And all of the wrath that he has for the things we've done wrong, he put on his own son on the cross of Calvary. And he says, if you will trust that what I have done in him is satisfactory, then we will be reconciled to each other. He's fulfilled the law that you can't live. He's taken the wrath that you deserve. And he will give you his righteousness in exchange for the wrath. And that is the offer and the wonderful bargain that God gives us in the person of Jesus Christ. The wages of sin is death. And we're all heading there. And we're already dead spiritually anyway, apart from Jesus Christ. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Paul goes on to say how simple it is to become a Christian, to become a true Christian. If you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. That's not a vow. That's just simply reaching out in faith and saying, I want what Jesus has done. I want it in my life, and I want to take all of the punishment that I deserve, and I want it laid at the foot of the cross of Calvary. So if you've never made that commitment today, please do it. Now is the time of God's favor. Today is the day of salvation. And Jesus Christ really promises you nothing more than today. You don't know if this is your last day. So if you've never made that heart commitment to the Lord, do so. And then be restored to him. And just live full of the joy of the Lord all the rest of your years. Our closing verse for today comes from Jeremiah chapter 30. For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. See, the Lord is faithful. He said he's going to do it, and he's done it. Regardless of whether we agree with that or whether we think they deserve it or whatever, God is faithful to his word, and so every other word that is in his Bible must be true to us. And you have a right to stand on those promises and to know that you are reconciled to God forever through Jesus Christ. You have a right to that because he has proved it in his faithfulness to this unfaithful group of people. Next week is Genesis 31 verses 14 through 30. It's called Jacob's Flight. That'll be our 75th Genesis sermon. And um, I'll tell you this, the Lord has you exactly where he wants you, exactly. And he has a good plan and a purpose for you. So let him do, call on him and let him do marvelous things for you and through you. All right, here's our poem and then we'll take communion. Return to the land of your fathers. Got another helicopter coming. Now Jacob heard the words of Laban's son saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's and from what was our father's, his bills he is paying. He has acquired all this wealth and us, it bothers. And Jacob saw the countenance of Laban, it was truly sore. And indeed it was not favorable to him as before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, return to your father's land and to your family and I will be with you at your right hand. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah at once to the field and to his flock to tell the score. And he said to them, I see your father's countenance that it is not favorable towards me as before. But the God of my father has been with me and you know that I, with all my might, I have served him faithfully. Yet your father has acted deceivingly and changed my wages 10 times, but God did not allow him to hurt me. Let me tell you about his crimes. If he said, the speckled shall your wages be, then all the flocks bore speckled, as he could clearly see. And if he said, the streaked shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore streaked, causing him rages. So God has taken away all the livestock of your father and given them to me, to me and not another. And it happened at the time when the flocks conceived that I lifted my eyes and saw in a dream that I got it. 
And the rams which leaped upon the flocks I perceived were streaked, speckled, and gray-spotted. Then the angel of God spoke to me, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift your eyes now and see. Direct your eyes toward each ram. All the rams which leap upon the flocks you pass through are streaked, speckled, and gray-spotted. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you and the ill treatment he has plotted. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed, the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land as I have appointed, and return to the land of your family. This is Jacob's life story, the genesis of the people Israel, the people through whom would come the glory, and it is a marvelous story to tell. Through this family will come our majestic King, the Savior of the world and our glorious Lord. It is to our beloved Jesus we sing, He, God incarnate, the eternal word. Thank you, O oh God, for this beautiful story of the coming of Christ and his majestic glory. Hallelujah and amen. Heavenly Father, here we are just marveling at your beautiful word, things that have been promised in the past and which have been fulfilled, and all of those things which are yet to be fulfilled, we know with absolute certainty that they will come about because you're a covenant-keeping and promise-keeping God. And we look forward in anticipation to the day when Jesus comes and he restores us to completely new and eternal life, resurrected bodies and uh, just living in your presence forever and ever. What a great and glorious promise we have in the pages of the Bible. And Lord, please do bless each person here. Take care of them in the week ahead. Uh, lead them down paths of righteousness for your name's sake and bring them again to a house of worship uh, next Sunday so that they can learn more about who you are and the things that you have for them. We love you. We praise you. We want to give you all the glory that you're due, and we can only do it by acknowledging your Son, our Lord and Savior. So it's in his name we pray. Amen.